Hi, this is Rok Reh Sham and today's lecture is about the rheumatology. This lecture is suitable for those people who are either going to start their PLAB1 preparation or who are done with their preparation and before the exam they are going to revise. Well, nevertheless, you can go through this exam anytime in between, but particularly for those people who are going to start or who are going for the revision. Okay, so uh, starting from the auto antibodies, okay. SLE. So SLE has anti-DST and antibodies. Okay, these are 99% specific and 70% sensitive anti-DST and A. The other antibodies that are present in SLE, those are anti-SMN antibodies. They are 99% specific but less sensitive as compared to the DST and A, which is 70% sensitive. But these SM antibodies are 30% sensitive. So whenever you have to choose, choose between the two you need to choose anti-DS2 and A. 99% of the patients uh, in SLE they have an ANA antibodies but like ANA are not specific they are there in most of the rheumatological diseases autoimmune diseases uh, sometimes they just change the options there are no anti-DS2 and A there are no SM but there is ANA in that case you need to choose the ANA over here the next thing is uh, drug-induced lupus, so antihistone antibodies are positive. Your MCQs are going to be like this, okay, that if somebody is having a drug-induced lupus, which antibodies will be positive? Some straight questions will be over there. The difference between the SLE and the drug-induced lupus is that in the drug-induced lupus, it doesn't has the glomerulonephritis. The patient do not have the glomerulonephritis. In SLE, there is glomerulonephritis. And which glomerulonephritis is most common that could be one of the mcqs that is diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis and what you give initially the steroids and then the mycophenolate okay uh, then comes the uh, systemic sclerosis and uh, sorry diffuse scleroderma diffuse scleroderma this is limited and there's a diffuse uh, scleroderma so in the diffuse scleroderma there are ntcl 70 antibodies the other name for anti-cl70 you need to remember that that is topoisomerase 1 topoisomerase 1 so you need to remember that one uh, for the limited scleroderma you have anti-centromere antibodies anti-centromere antibodies okay so for polymyositis you have anti jo one antibodies um, for dermatomyositis, there are, uh, um, yeah, there are anti-MI2 antibodies, okay. Um, these anti-centromere antibodies, the second name for them is anti-synthetase antibodies. So you need to remember that one. There, sometimes there is no anti-GO1, there is anti-synthetase. You need to go for that. And sometimes there is no anti-SCL17 in case of scleroderma. So there is anti uh, topomerase 1 antibody so you need to choose that one you need to remember this thing okay then is uh, the Sjogren syndrome there's anti rho and anti la antibodies these anti rho and anti rho particularly is there in uh, you need to check that one in a patient who is SLE and who is pregnant because they are linked with the heart box in uh, the neonates actually those ladies who are having the SLE, you need, and they are pregnant, you need to check for anti row antibodies. If they are positive, the the child, okay, the neonate, has a chances of having the heart blocks. So you check that one. So anti row, you need to remember as far as so Sjogren syndrome is concerned, and also for the SLE, a pregnant lady with SLE. For primary biliary cirrhosis, anti mitochondrial antibodies, that is AMA. For autoimmune antibodies, uh, autoimmune hepatitis, that's anti-smooth muscle antibodies. You need to remember these things, okay? They are off like that, and sometimes we are um, a little bit, little bit uh, confused in this thing uh, because there are so many antibodies. You need to remember those, okay? Uh, let's go next. Okay, there are some other like in shrug straw syndrome. That's PNK in vaginal granulotosis. There's CNK, okay, in the celiac disease. Okay, if you have to choose one, that, should, that is anti-tissue transglutaminase out of all these. Okay, do not choose anti-gladin gladin or anti-endomazial antibodies. Choose the anti-tissue transglutaminase. Okay, then grave disease. Yeah, you know that in the grave disease, there are T 
TSH receptor antibodies, though there is thyroid peroxidase antibodies, but choose TSH receptor in the graves if it's there. Then in the rheumatoid arthritis, you know that it's a rheumatic factor that is an anti-CCP antibodies. Now let's come to the SLE. So SLE is actually a multi-system, uh, multi-organ disease, okay, as you say. So you have the involvement of the multiple organs, um, okay. There is, uh, starting from generally, there's a fatigue, fever, there are mouth ulcers, okay. It can involve your skin, you, you have mellow rash, okay, that's a call, butterfly rash, discoid rash, photosensitivity, Renaud is there, then arthritis is there, uh, then could be pericarditis, pleuritis, there could be renal involvement, there, will, there can be hematological involvement, hemolytic anemias, leukopenia, or thrombocytopenia, okay, so there, there could be the neurological involvement like sears and psychosis as well so it's a multi-system multi-organ disease okay that's of the autoimmune etiology so here you can see um yeah it has clearly mentioned over here so you have cns involvement you have cardiac you have uh, respiratory involvement you you have joint involvement skin is involved over there kidneys are involved over there okay so, so many things over there in SLE. Okay, so AN is positive in SLE. As I have already said, 99% sensitive. Anti DS3 NA, that is highly specific, 99%, and 70% sensitive. The other thing is, I said anti SM antibodies. Maybe there's no NA, there's no anti DS3 NA. So, choose the anti SM that is 99% specific and 30% sensitive. Complement level is decreased. Okay, so antihistone is uh, only in drug-induced lupus. Okay, we're going to discuss the drug-induced lupus. Uh, okay, let's discuss it over here. The drugs which can cause the drug-induced lupus that are hydralazine, isoniazid, procanamide, and quinidine. Okay, the difference is that here kidney, there's no kidney involvement. And once you stop the drug, the effect's going to go away. Okay, and anti-DS DNA, that is negative in drug-induced lupus. Okay, and also um, the low level of complement is rarely seen in drug-induced lupus. So the difference between the SLE um, and the drug-induced lupus is that, let me summarize that one again, that the drug-induced lupus, there is no kidney involvement. And once you stop the drug, it's going to go away. anti ts DNA is mostly negative. And this hypocomplement Hemia, that is decreased complement level in the uh, C3 and C4 in the SLE, that's not over there. The drugs involve hydralazine, procanamide, and quinidine, uh, and isoniazide, of course. Um, if you are, talk about the HLA association, DR3 and DR4 association is there. Mostly it is in the females for SLE. Um, the female to male ratio is 9 ratio 1, and the age group is uh, it's more common in between uh, 20 to 40 age bracket uh, in the females. Okay, uh, there are the Im other important things you need to remember that you check the ESR and anti DS DNA for the disease activity in SLE. CRP is normally uh, it, it's it's normally not raised in the SLE. If it is raised significantly, you might consider other things like infection. Okay, that was about the SLE. So what you give, there are not much treatment options available. Um, you uh, give for the skin for the arthralgia, you give the hydroxychloroquine, that is HCQ. Uh, then for the arthralgia, you can give the NSAIDs. In flares, you can go for the prednisolone. Okay, and if there is a kidney involvement, go for mycophenolate okay rather than cyclophosphamide cyclophosphamide is a second line choose mycophenolate if it's over there okay um there are certain other things as well which i would like to discuss over here is that uh, fertility rates are normal in uh, patients with sle okay but spontaneous abortions and the stillbirths they are more common as compared to the normal people so the it, sle doesn't affect uh, the fertility and uh, there is something other that is linked with SLE that is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome okay so you need to check for that um, in those patients who are uh, having the SLE coming with uh, um, 
the recurrent abortions, particularly the first and the second trimester abortions. Uh, and when a lady is pregnant with SLE, you need to check for anti-RO, that is Rho and anti-LA antibodies, because those people, those ladies, okay, the, the neonates, that causes uh, the heart blocks in the neonates. Uh, then the drug-induced lupus, I have already said uh, much about that. The hydralazine, isoniazid, pocanamide, and quinidine, okay, and I have already told you the differences. This is a tool, this is uh, a little bit uh, more about, okay, uh, the questions which they are going to ask, which one is more sensitive, ANA is most sensitive, okay. Um, what's the initial test? ANA is the initial test you need to go for. What is the best screening test? ANA, okay. Now, in the new criteria, they have put the thing over uh, in the SLE diagnosis that check for the ANA because the 99% specific uh, sensitive story need to be positive. If that's not positive, ANA must be positive, okay, for the SLE. So they have included in the criteria that if you are suspecting an SLE in some patient, so go for the ANA. If it's positive, then go for the further things. So what is most specific? That is anti-DSTNA. Most discriminative? That is anti-DSTNA. There is other thing that is anti-Smith antibodies that is um, equally specific as compared to the anti-DSTNA, but that is less sensitive. So you need to choose for the anti-DSTNA. Okay, the next thing uh, comes here is chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay, what is chronic fatigue syndrome, by the way? So, in the chronic fatigue syndrome is when somebody is having a four month of disability fatigue. Okay, four month period, okay, you have a disability fatigue and that's present for the four months these people they have sleep dis disturbance they have muscle joint x sore throat headaches okay and they have tender lymph nodes which are not swollen okay which are, which are not swollen but they are painful okay uh, then they have what, cognitive dysfunctions dizziness palpitations and one very thing is that any of the physical exertions that worsen their symptoms Okay, you can remember something like that, a chronic fatigue syndrome, a four month of fatigue in a patient, okay, having sleep disturbance, having accent pains, okay, having uh, swollen, not the swollen, okay, just painful lymph nodes. They are normal in size, but they are painful. And all these things put together, that's going to disturb your cognitive function. You cannot concentrate, okay, you cannot, and any of the exertion these patients make that wasn't there symptoms so what you're going to do the treatment is cbt first line the second thing is graded exercises okay like they don't need to exert much okay they need to keep piercing like graded exercises gradually they need to build their activity um, the other thing is pacing okay and in some of the patients if these things are not working you can give uh, low dose amitriptyline that is tricyclic antidepressants so that was about the chronic fatigue syndrome okay now comes the polymyositis so what is polymyositis so um, something you can uh, like guess from the the name itself it implies itself that is related to the muscles okay so polymyositis so this is actually an inflammatory myopathy okay there's also an inflammation of the muscle and it presents with the progressive muscle weakness okay the one thing is polymyositis and the other thing is dermatomyositis difference is in the dermatomyositis there is a muscle weakness but but there is uh, the skin involvement as well in pull in dermatomyositis as the name implies that the dermatomyositis, derma skin and myositis means muscles, okay, that are involved. So let me repeat that said, these are inflammatory myopathies both, both in which there's a progressive muscle weakness. In polymyositis, there's just muscle involvement. In dermatomyositis, there is muscle involvement as well as there is skin involvement as well. Okay. So polymyositis is symmetrical and diffuse muscle weakness, proximal greater than distal, so have difficulty rising from the low chair, climbing steps, uh, lifting objects, and combing hair. Yeah. Um, well, the difference 
between the polymyositis, dermatomyositis with the other um, myopathies like uh, eton lemon syndrome or myasthenia gravis is that ocular muscles are never involved in polymyositis or dermatomyositis. Okay, so that is a feature that differentiates. You know, some my myasthenia gravis, there is ptosis. Okay, um, there is involvement of. Uh, yeah, there's dysphagia, there's dysphonia. Ocular muscles, okay, the ptosis, that's not there in these inflammatory myopathies, but that's over there in myasthenia gravis as well as in eton lambert syndrome. Polymyositis is just the progressive muscle weakness. In dermatomyositis, there's a skin involvement, like heli helicotropic rash. That's a purple uh, discoloration of the face, eyelid, and sun exposure area, and there are something that's uh, grotten papules. I believe you might have heard of this thing. Um, these are the scaly lesions seen sometime over the knuckles. Okay, that is the dor dorsal aspect of your pharyngeal joints, um, especially the metacarpophyngeal joints. Okay, so let's come to the polymyositis. Um, so, um, what are the investigations? The CPQ is raised over. Okay, that's significantly raised, sometimes up to 54. Okay, in polymyositis, anti juo one antibodies, these are raised, and the other name for anti juo is anti synthetase antibodies. Okay, anti synthetase antibodies. Increase um, LDH and LDLs. Yeah, yes, you do the electromyography as well. And you go for the muscle biopsy, that is the most definitive thing. Okay, so CPK. The antibodies, anti juo one uh, for the polymyositis and anti-MI2 for dermatomyositis. And you do the EMG and the muscle biopsy, that is more specific. Um, in dermatomyositis, there is a muscle involvement, uh, there is a skin involvement, as I said. And dermatomyositis, that is also linked with the risk of developing the cancers. Okay, they have the risk of developing the cancers, those people who are having a dermatomyositis, like ovarian cancer. So anyone who is coming with a dermatomyositis, you need to screen for these cancers as well. Okay, so um, what's going to be the treatment? Steroids. Okay, steroids are useful in polymyositis as well as dermatomyositis. Okay, sometimes in you give the intravenous immunoglobulins in a dermatomyositis. Okay, and other things like bed rest and some physiotherapy that might be helpful. So, how are you going to follow the disease activity? Okay, in polymyositis or dermatomyositis, it's by the two things it's by the clinical assessment of muscle power and by the CPK that is creatine phosphokinase. Okay. So, that's all about the polymyositis and the dermatomyositis. So we have done the dermatomyositis as well. So you can have a look over that helicotropic rash, curtain pebbles, shawl sign is over there, a rash around the neck. Okay. So skin involvement, dermatomyositis. You can see the curtain pebbles over here. Okay. The things remain the same um, for uh, the treatment options as well as uh, the diagnosis, the labs. They remain the same, uh, but. Yes, in uh, dermatomyositis, there is there is skin involvement. Okay, the next topic is uh, polymyalgia rheumatica. The scenario will be an old lady, okay, that is coming to you with the pain, okay, in shoulders and in the pelvic girdle. Again, okay, is a difficulty in getting out of the bed and raising the arms, okay. So this would be the history of an old lady that is coming to you with the pan in the pelvic girdle as well as the pan in the shoulder. Okay. So this this is uh, the polymyalgia rheumatica. Okay. And this is associated with temporal arthritis or cancer, giant cell arthritis. Okay. So always somebody is coming to you with the polymyalgia rheumatica. You need to screen that one for temporal arthritis. Any problem with the vision, you need to ask shock litigation and all that sort of things which are present in the temporal arthritis. Okay. So ESR would be hit raised. That is the most important thing. You need to remember if somebody's ESR is raised, 
okay and they have normal creatine kinase and treatment is steroid okay the moment you're going to put the patient on the steroid okay their ears their symptoms become better and the ears are okay comes down okay so that that's the thing so remember with the people but it says polymyalgia the pain but not the weakness so muscles are tender that's not true weakness mm. okay that's fine enough in polymyalgia okay you need to remember okay somebody some lady particularly over the 50 coming to you with a pan in the shoulder and pan in the pelvic girdle you go for the esr that is this you put on the steroids okay C cpk is normal over there that's all about which i have already told you and then the topic comes that's the temporal arthritis um that's the problem with the medium to large vessels okay these people uh, they come with a headache jaw claudication okay scalp tenderness of uh, you'll feel problem that is the most serious thing over here um, and that is associated with the polymyalgia rheumatica that is the most important thing to remember over here okay they have raised esr the definitive is a temporal um, artery biopsy well is that uh, always going to give you something no temporal they, they have skip lanes okay maybe you are going to take uh, that portion of the biopsy where there's nothing so um, even if the patient is presenting with the symptoms and if it's saying okay you are very much sure that it's a temporal arthritis chocolate education the problem um, with uh, the headache it's a tender scalp they have the problem with the vn the biopsy is normal still it could be joint cell arthritis because it's a, it, as there are the skip lanes there's no continuous thing over there so my biopsy might have been taken from it where it was normal so it's not like it's not it's, it's not that perhaps is going to be always positive over here treatment is high dose steroids okay high dose steroids to to prevent the permanent loss of vn um when there's a eye involvement give iv steroids otherwise like you can give uh, the oral steroids no problem at all well the role of the aspirin uh literally it's controversial okay some of the researchers they say that okay you can give the aspirin uh, some do sport some do not sport it's the role is controversial okay that's a joint cell arthritis okay well, let's uh, see this one a uh, patient with a headache and scalp tenderness typical job pain presents to emergency department what is appropriate management steroids don't delay the steroid okay don't delay the steroid because there is uh, a risk of losing the vns to start the steroids okay okay now comes uh chokron syndrome okay let's go to the chokron syndrome so that's an autoimmune uh disease of the exocrine glands actually it is uh, characterized by the lymphocytic infiltration of exocrine glands uh, resulting in xerostomia and dry eyes okay and uh, yeah so there's an enlargement of protein and uh, lacrimal glands uh, dry eyes dry mouths associated with uh, rheumatoid and SLN scleroderma so what kinds of tests we're going to do in uh, Sjogren syndrome so it's a Schremer test um, that will show decreased tear production um, the other is uh, Rose Bengal stand will uh, document the corneal illustration because they have dry cornea so ANA will be positive and the more uh, like specific or anti Rho and anti LA antibodies. Okay, the RF is positive, AN is positive. Okay, so lymphocytic infiltration of the salivary gland will be noted on the biopsy as well if you're going to take the biopsy. Treatment includes artificial tears and plenty of water, nothing else. Okay, uh, sometimes pylocarpine is also used that increases the acetylcholine and increases the tear in the saliva production. Uh, there's no, by the way, there's no specific cure for the Sjogren syndrome, okay? Uh, but lifespan is normal in these patients. Evaluate these patients for the lymphoma. This is something you need to remember, okay? Evaluate these patients, okay, for the lymphoma because they have a tendency of developing the lymphomas. That is about uh, the Sjogren syndrome. 
Okay. So next is hypermilosis. Hypromilosis. Um, that's a type of eye drop to help um, treat the dry eyes. Oh, well, that's not important. Now comes another important thing that is uh, systemic sclerosis. Another very important topic. So they have actually the two things. There are many types actually, believe me. But at your level, just be limited to over here. Limited and the diffuse. Okay. Um, in the limited, this crest is actually a, 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 a subtype of limited. Okay. Limited is, a, limited is actually uh, where there is the skin involvement is not extensive. Okay. And the organ involvement is less. Um, like if it started from your fingers then it's gonna go up to your your elbow and not beyond that if you started from the foot it should go up to your knee and not beyond that okay that is limited um, scleroderma and in the diffuse that's a rapid onset involves the trunks and the lymph lymphs and the go up for okay so actually this is a chronic multi-system disease okay that is characterized by thickening of the skin um, that's there is accumulation um, of connective tissue and uh, involvement of uh, the visceral organs like GI and the kidney. Renaud phenomena. All the patients have the Renaud phenomena and the skin thickening almost. Okay. Uh, in limited, you need to remember that one by crest. That's calcineous Renaud es esophageal dysmotility, sclerodectal, and telangiectasias. Pulmonary involvement is actually the most leading cause of uh, death in patients who are having the scleroderma. Okay, actually, uh, there is systemic sclerosis and there is localized scleroderma. Okay, and there are two, three types in the localized scleroderma and the systemic sclerosis has uh, limited cutaneous and limited crust. But you need not go into that detail. Just remember that one. There's a limited and there is a diffuse. And the limited, there is a crest. And in the diffuse, there is extensive involvement, okay, uh, of the skin as well as the internal in, um, internal organs. So, if we talk about the antibodies over here, anti CL70, they are positive over here. Anti CL70 in diffuse, while in uh, limited, there are anti centromere antibodies. Those are positive. Okay, and uh, the other name for NTCL70, I already told you what was that. The other name for NTCL70 was, uh, yeah, that was topo isomerase 1. Okay, NTCL70. That was anti topo isomerase 1 antibodies. Uh, yeah, that are in the diffuse and anti centromere antibodies that are there in limited scleroderma. Okay, so now comes the seronegative spondyloarthropathies. Okay, there are there are like three four things over there: psoriatic and collagen spondylitis, arthritis syndrome, Bechet's IBD associated arthritis. Okay, there are some specific features which are there in uh, these. Uh, uh, seronegative spondyloarthropathies. Uh, which are those? Let me tell you. Um, they are mostly they are ANA negative and RF negative, rheumatoid factor negative. Okay. Uh, they involve the lower back and the sacroiliac joints. And they have HLA B27 association and they have extra articular manifestations. These seronegative, uh, seronegative, that's why we say because ANA negative, they are RF negative. Okay, and uh, yeah, these four features are over there. Most of them have these four features that are ANA negative, RF negative, involve the lower back and the sacroiliac joint, uh, HLB27 association, and the extra articular manifestation is over there. So let's discuss Bechet disease. Okay, these are somebody's coming to you with the oral and the genital ulcer. Okay. You need to consider the Bechet disease, uh, anterior and posterior uveitis, and uh, pathology that is uh, exaggerated uh, skin injury after the minor trauma. So, what you need to go 
Gonitko for the tropical steroids. The other very important thing that is uh, ankylosing spondylitis in the seronegative. So it's a young guy who is presenting with the lower back pain to you. Okay, he has a chronic lower back pain. Okay, in early 20s or 30s. So the patient will be coming to you with a morning stiffness that is lasting at least for one hour and improves with the exercise. A young guy who is in the 20s and 30s coming with a chronic lower back pain that is there in the morning and that alleviates with some kind of uh, activity. Okay, um, yeah, this these patients with ankylosing spondylitis, they can have some extra articular manifestation, okay, like all the A's you need to remember, interior uveitis, aortic insufficiency, okay, AV blocks, okay, they are there in these patients. Okay, so what treatment you're gonna go, uh, sorry, what, what is the examination uh, findings? Okay, there's a positive Schauber test that will be over there, there's decreased spine mobility, okay, Sometimes there's lumbar lordosis as well. Uh, X-ray is going to show you the sacroiliitis. You need to remember this thing, okay? What is there in the X-ray? Sacroiliitis, okay? Sacroiliitis. The other things on the X-ray could be squaring of lumbar vertebra. Squaring of the lumbar vertebra. Um, there's a bamboo spine you can see over here. There's a bamboo spine. Squaring of lumbar vertebra is over there. Okay? And uh, syndesmophytes. Okay, uh, that is uh, abnormality of the actually the, the spinal column. Okay, this vertebral that's characterized by calcification and ossification of um, interosseous um, interspinous ligaments. Okay, and that appears as a continuous line. You can see it over here as well. Okay, the spinous process they are appearing as a continuous line because of the calcification. Okay, giving a tram line appearance. Okay, so on the x-ray you need to remember there's a sacroiliitis, fusion of sacroiliac joint, squaring of uh, vertebral bodies and bamboo spine. Yeah, so um, what are the treatment options over here? Okay, um, NSAIDs, okay, there are there, physiotherapy is there, exercise is there, okay. Um, and these TNFs. Um, adalimumab and internocept. Okay, they are there. Unlike rheumatoid, anti-TNF medications are used first, okay, um, before the methotrexate. And particularly, they are good for um, the axial skeletal involvement, okay, not good for the peripheral, but axial skeletal. Better, they work better for the axial disease, okay. In uh, rheumatoid arthritis, we're going to discuss that one in uh, couple of minutes you give the methotrexate first and then if that's not working you you either go towards or you, or you add the uh, anti tnf okay and the monoclonal antibodies here give the inside and all that sort of stuff if that works okay then you go for anti tnf rather than uh, methotrexate so this is uh, a disease of the young people particularly the young males uh the next thing comes is uh Writer syndrome or reactive arthritis. Okay, so a mnemonic for that is okay, which most of the people use is can't see, can't be, can't climb a tree. Actually, that's a triad of urethritis, conjectivitis, and arthritis. Okay, that is the writer syndrome or the reactive arthritis. Okay. So it's actually um, occurs as a complication from an infection somewhere in the body. Okay. Either most common is actually the compilobacter. Okay, it happens after a diarrhea, infectious diarrhea that's called by compilobacter. Um, could happen actually uh, after a non gonococcal urethritis, like from the chlamydia. So that could be either both of either from a diarrhea that is because of the chlamydia or uh, a urethritis that is because of chlamydia that is non gonococcal arthritis. So it's a triad, as I said, conjectivitis, urethritis, and arthritis. Could be post diarrhea, could be post STI, that is sexually transmitted infection. Um, post STI is more common in uh, men, actually, and the post dysentery, that is because of compilobacter, that is uh, equal in uh, both male and the female, okay, the incidences. So Diagnosis is based on uh, this clinical criteria and the extra findings are there. 
okay as this is a zero negative so you know that ANA will be negative RF will gonna be negative there will be a chelib 27 association okay um, treatment um, is actually analgesia and NSAIDs okay uh, it really lasts more than 12 months okay um, you have to give sometimes uh, the other things as well okay like the AS okay um, you give sometimes sulfazolazine, methotrexate in these patients. Okay, there are one or two other things that are uh, the complications uh, from the infection, uh, rheumatic, uh, sorry, reactive arthritis, that is keratoderma, blenohemorrhagicum, and sarcinate bovonitis. Okay, uh, what is keratoderma? Um, Hemorrhagicum that is a cutaneous manifestation of writer syndrome actually involves uh, the soles and the palms toes and the glass penis as characterized by the thromatous macules actually that from from the blister and uh, later they develop in uh, thick carototic covering and the succinate balanized dust that's a shallow palace also um, with gray borders that is seen on the glass in some patients with rheumatoid that's not going to be in every patient is uh, Keratoderma balana hemorrhagicum assassinate balanitis, but you need to remember this. Um, yeah, that's there um, in some patients with the writer syndrome or the reactive arthritis. Okay, let's go towards the gout. Okay, another interesting, important topic that is gout. Okay, important one, important one. Okay, so what is gout actually? Okay, so this is actually the arthropathy um, in, in which the monosodium urate crystals, okay, they tend to accumulate in your joints, in your synovial fluid. Okay, um, that is gout. Most of the times your first big toe that is involved, uh, the second joint that is involved most commonly that could be in ankle and sometimes the knee joint is also involved. Okay, that is gout. So there are the certain uh, things which are associated with the gout, like which cause gout, like meat and the alcohol, uh, tumor lysis syndrome. Okay, sometimes uh, someone who is taking the chemotherapy, particularly chronic kidney disease, uh, those who who are taking the thiazide diuretics are some of the AC inhibitors as well, uh, less likely, but yeah, thiazide diuretics. It most commonly involves, as I said, the first metal tarsal pharyngeal joint um, how are you going to diagnose this patient okay that is by the joint aspiration okay there you're going to see the monosodium urate crystals that are negatively bifringent okay you need to remember this thing negatively bifringent monosodium urate crystals okay that you're going to see Again, okay, a patient with the gout, and what test you're going to choose? Okay, that is needle aspiration. Okay, that is needle aspiration. So, those are again, I'm going to repeat monosodium urate crystals that are neg needle shape negatively bifringent. Okay, on x ray, you can see the things like uh, punched out lesions, but they are not present in um, the first attack. After the repeated attacks, there will be the punched out lesions on the x-ray. Okay, so now uh, coming to the treatment. Um, the treatment is NSAID or colchicine. That's the first line. Whenever the patient is having this uh, attack, there will be the heart swollen first metacarpopharyngeal joint. That's tender. Okay, even if you do not treat that one, that's going to go away in seven, eight days. Okay, but the treatment is either NSAID or colchicine combined with the PPI okay so if there's an option with the that's combined with the PPI choose that one rather than choosing simply an NSAID or a colchicine so if that's not there okay NSAID or colchicine any of them you can choose but if it's a combined option there's an NSAID plus PPI choose that one okay so NSAID or the colchicine and steroids in some cases okay if they are not working so colchicine actually inhibits the microtubules polymerization um, and uh, also inhibits the neutrophilic activity. It, it has a slower onset than the NSAIDs. Okay. 
uh, very important thing okay maybe that's they're gonna ask you this thing is that you need to decrease the dose of colchicine when the gfr is between 10 to 50 okay and if it's less than 10 Okay, maybe they are going to give you, okay, the patient with the CKD having a GFR of less than 10. Avoid, avoid this, uh, that's contraindicated actually, below 10. Okay. Consider all steroids if this NSAID or colchicine are contraindicated or if they are not working. Okay. And don't start a patient on uh, usually lowering th therapy. Okay, if it's or allopurinol, that are xanthine oxidase inhibitors, do not give okay during an attack once this attack subsides then you can start on um, these urate lowering therapies there is another important point is that if patient is already taking allopurinol okay that is a urate lowering drug and he has an attack now there you can continue the allopurinol okay but you cannot start somebody because that's going to end up in flare okay so allopurinol is first line okay but once this acute attack subsides okay you give the NSAID or colchicine with the ppi in uh, this acute attack and after seven eight da days okay once it once it's gone then you can start on the allopurinol okay that's the first line the second line is fibroxistrate okay both allopurinol and fibroxistrate are xanthine oxidase inhibitor in refractory cases you can use uricase uricase is actually a drug that converts this uric acid to allantoin and okay you can get rid of okay the uric acid um in persistent in refractory cases uricase okay you need to remember in persistent uh, symptoms despite these urate uh urate lowering therapies paglotikos is uh infusion um every two weekly that that is enough an option uh well there are certain general things okay like vitamin c it decreases the uric acid um yeah, in your body uh, the other thing is if somebody is taking uh, these all ac inhibitors they actually um build up uh, the uric acid in your uh, your blood okay um but one of them that is low sartan you can remember that one from low low means it's low is the uric acid so somebody is taking the wall sartan sometimes the question is like this and uh, there's no, nothing other thing but so wall sartan over there what you're gonna do so switch wall sartan to low sartan okay so yeah these are all the things about the gout uh, i believe i haven't left anything that is important okay the, another important thing is that uh, when when you're gonna start uh, the profile axis okay so new guidelines say that offer urate lowering therapy after the first attack even okay uh, but there are like certain things where it is recommended particularly if there are like two greater than two or two attacks in a year this tofi or there are urate 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 stones or somebody is taking a cytotoxic drug on the chemotherapy okay um yeah you need to give those people uh, the urate lowering therapy i think rest of the things we're going to discuss in the second lecture